Hi. As many people might know, um, other than Formula One, I am quite into my history. Um, as a result of which, my dad, about 15 years ago, bought me this book. So, early one morning. It's basically an adventure novel, a daring racing driver, it retires, chilling out, relaxing, having a nice life. World War Two breaks out, goes and fights for his country, ends up being a spy. And, you know, what happens after that? Yeah, as in an adventure story of, you know, brave heroics, it's a fantastic book. Um, what reminded me of it today was, um, this is the 14th of April, and on Twitter I keep having anniversary things for the first Monaco Grand Prix in 1929. And that was won by a guy called William Grover Williams, who is the person this book is about. So let's have a look at his life. William Grover Williams was born um, on 16th of January 1903. He had an English father who dealt with horses, was very successful in that, and a French mother. Um, at the time the First World War broke out, he ended up moving back to England for safety reasons, obviously with France being very invaded at this point. Um, but growing up with that background, he grew up fluent in English and French. Um, after the war, his family then moved to Monte Carlo. Um, so obviously this may play into his story later on. And there he learned to drive behind the wheel of his sister's boyfriend's Rolls Royce, I think it was. So quite a life. Um, he first got into racing when he got given a motorbike, um, but he was racing under W. Williams, I think it was at the time, because basically he didn't want his parents to find out he was going racing. So following on from that, he um, became a chauffeur for an Irish artist called Sir William Orpin in decadent post-war Paris and this is where the novel picks the story up as he falls in love with becomes friends with Orpin's mistress uh, Eve or Week I can't pronounce her surname sorry um, so in the novel after they end up getting together um, she ends up buying him a Bugatti with money that Orpin had left the pair of them and <clears throat> they end up painting it in British racing green and he goes racing at Monaco with it um, you know, the guy nobody's heard of who goes on to win this race and, you know, then gets the notice of Robert Benoit and the Bietti family and stuff. It's a slight change from history in this one because, according to the stuff I've read when I was looking up on this, he actually started racing Bugattis in about 1926 and actually won the French Grand Prix in 1928. So, I hazard a guess when he went to Monte Carlo, he was some what more wasn't just an unknown um the race in monte carlo is a weird one the thing about the british racing green bugatti because of course bugattis are traditionally blue is actually true um but when they was started the race the grid was picked according to basically a lottery um yet somehow five out of the first six cars starting all managed to be bugattis um William Grover Williams started in fifth in the middle of the second row. He um, would go on to win the race after three hours and 56 minutes and 100 laps of it. Um, I've seen footage of it on YouTube. Well, I'm sure it's available on other streaming platform, watching platforms as well. Um, of uh, the path, I think it was, film from that time about the race, which basically is about a two-minute long film, just showing the cars going round the track and what have you, and him after the race. And the track itself still looks very similar to how it does now. You can tell, you know, which parts are which of it. Um, and but it's just strange seeing these classic 1920s cars, Bugatti E35, the 35s that they were, he was driving at the time, going around the corners and the back end sliding, and then the really narrow tyres that they had on the cars during that period in time. Um, and the old footage of just like the cap and the goggles. But yeah, needless to say, he won. Um, and 
say. In the novel, that's the point he comes to the attention of the Bugatti family and is sort of accepted into the racing driver fraternity to a certain extent. And then he goes on to have, you know, expands on his relationship with the other drivers and what have you. Um, how much of a relationship he did have with guys like Robert Benoit and whatever during this period, I can't actually find too much to talk about on that one short of this probably book some Bugatti and whatever else about it during that period, but to get this video out sometime in the next few weeks, I'm not going to get a chance to read them, to be quite honest with you. But moving on from that, he just said he had a decent career as a racing driver, um, with seven Grand Prix wins in total, the last of which was in 1933. Um, and he would eventually retire in 1936 because the Bugattis by this point were a little underpowered compared to the rise of the German machines um, in the late 30s. But following on from that, you know, he retired, comfortable existence, quite well off by this point, him and his wife, happy life. Um, and then World War II broke out and being English, or as he viewed himself being British anyway, um, he then joined the British Army and worked as a driver for various generals and senior staff. And when the German advance began in 1940, uh, he was driving back and they couldn't get to Dunkirk and got cut off. And eventually, after driving bravely through various roadblocks and God knows whatever else, he eventually got the staff officer he was with back to England. And when they got back to England, SOE, which is Special Operations Executive, took an interest in him because fluent English, fluent French, very useful skills to have. Um, so then he joined and got tasked with organising his own set behind enemy lines in France, going undercover, secret agent stuff. And that's when it gets even more interesting, as if everything else wasn't enough. As some of you may have noticed, the use of photos and other media in this is a little bit sporadic. Um, obviously, this is due largely to the period in time when it was. Finding pictures of people from the 1920s is a bit of a push. And moving into special operations, you probably won't be surprised to know, finding pictures of people when they're undercover... Um, and on espionage missions is harder still so I'm afraid there are probably going to be even less photos in the second half of this film thank you the cell was almost a fanciful thing you know the fastest drivers in Europe falling up together to try and free the world from Nazi oppression etc um, you know uh, they're credited with various attacks or sabotage things on the citron plants at the time. The cell itself was made up of a large number of ex Bugatti employees, including slightly randomly two of their former drivers who, whilst having won many Grand Prix for Bugatti as well, also won the 1937 Le Mans, I think it was for them. There's Robert Benoit and Jean-Pierre Wimel, and I apologise if I've got that wrong as well. I can't find anything saying how to actually pronounce it. Um, yeah. So, the fastest drivers in Europe as an underground set. Um, unfortunately, when they were flown in to France, they didn't have their own radio operator with them. So they were having to use one that was already established, who basically had been hesitates to use the word turned because obviously if these people get captured the threats of torture and physical and mental stuff that goes on or whatever else with them it's understandable to a certain extent that people will end up invariably doing whatever they might find they need to do not to save their lives necessarily but to prevent the death of people who are important to them or you know torture is not a nice thing let's be honest so this guy, the radio operative, was effectively a double agent and information that was going to William Cell was also going to the Gestapo. Um, they caught up with Maurice Benoit, I think it was, Robert Benoit's brother, and he basically gave the cell up. 
Um, the Gestapo sound, surrounded Robert Benoit's house and captured large numbers of the group, including William Gregor Williams. And while well, Benoit got away himself, the stories about him, <coughs> um, when he got flown back to England, they basically didn't, but they didn't trust him because they couldn't believe that anyone had managed the escapes and stuff that he did. And then they got talking to him and got the measure of the guy. And it was like, actually, yes, he's really, really good. Um, but at one point, there is a true story apparently about him ending up in a German convoy in a Bugatti and somehow managing to get away from it. And another one where he got captured about three weeks after the event of this house and was stuck in a car surrounded by Gestapo members. I don't notice the door wasn't shut properly. And when the car was in mid-turn, he flung himself into the Gestapo guy next to him out of the moving car through the door and got away then as well. And the guy, yeah, the, yeah, he's highly thought of. Um, there was a race immediately after the end of the war actually named after him. You know, him and Grover Williams actually both were awarded medals of honour posthumously. Um, not medals of honour, but whatever the French equivalent is, I can't remember exactly. Official records say that William Grover Williams died in 1945 in the Sessionhausen concentration camp, just before it was liberated. But in the book, uh, Robert Ryan, obviously during the course of putting together the research and whatever for it, ran to start chatting to a few people who had been doing their own research on it, one of whom was granddaughter of Robert Benoit. And what they found was some interesting things that may be correct, but is the story that they went with in the book anyway, um, that William Grover Williams may actually have escaped from the concentration camp by saying to the guard that he would put in a good word for him, which is quite possibly true. But what is true, and the angle it goes for in the book, is that not long after the war had finished, a van showed up at the, the widow of William Gregor Williams' house um, containing two giraffes. And the man who got out of it bore uh, what is considered to be a very strong similarity to William Grover Williams, also had a very strong knowledge of racing cars and a love of mechanics of them all. Um, she would later say to people that he was her cousin, but he would spend the rest of his life living with her. How true this is, you know, how true that is, it certainly sounds, it certainly looks slightly suspicious. Um, and it is a sort of great end to the story because when you consider all the things William Grover Williams did during his life, you can believe it might have gone that way. Um, let's say Robert Benoit sadly was executed in 1944. Jean-Pierre Wimel actually survived the war and returned to racing. Um, I think he raced in the race in Robert Benoit's name after the war. Um, but sadly, as is the way with people of this character. Um, he was killed in 1949 racing for Alfa Romeo, which is sort of the end of that story, unfortunately. Um, but he was considered, from what I've read, to be the greatest French racing driver up until the arrival of Alain Prost. So it's men like that in the age they lived in were never going to have dull, ordinary lives or die in expected manners, I guess. Um, the novel itself is a great read and I thoroughly recommend it to anyone. Um, anyway, thanks for watching the video. It's been a little bit off topic perhaps, but you know, I enjoy history and I love racing and this kind of covered both topics quite well. So if you've enjoyed this video then please give it a like and if you'd like to watch any more of my stuff then please subscribe to the channel. It's all very good. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.